In the case of the Gap, and for many retail firms, you're going to see the return on invested capital at this firm drop when you capitalize leases. That is going to have consequences for how much value you attach to the company. The net effect can be positive for some companies, neutral for some, and negative for some, depending upon what happens to the return on capital of the company relative to the cost of capital. In the case of the gap, for instance, the spread between the return on capital and the cost of capital decreases when I capitalize leases. And as a consequence, when I value the gap with leases treated as debt, which I think is the right thing to do, I'm going to get a lower value, but a more realistic value for the company. So anytime you have a contractual commitment, it might not just be leases, treat it as debt. Carry it through to its logical consequences. Here's a second item that you might have to, to do some adjusting for. Accountants, when they look at R&D, basically treat it as an operating expense. But R&D is really a capital expense. Step back, a capital expense is an expense designed to create benefits over many periods, right? And what company in its right mind does R&D expecting to get a benefit this year? So my first inclination with R&D is to treat it as a capital expense. And again, there are consequences. If I decide to treat R&D as a capital expense, I can't just start doing it this year. I need to go back in time and do it over previous years. What does that mean? Well, I have to capitalize R&D from five years ago, four years ago, three years ago. And when you capitalize an expense, remember you have to amortize or depreciate that expense and have to keep track of that as well. Again, it sounds messy, but to capitalize R&D, here's the three-step process you need to go through. First step, you need to give me an amortizable life for the R&D. You're saying, what the heck is that? Well, when you do R&D, you're not going to get a benefit right away. You've got to tell me, on average, how long it takes you between the time you do R&D and a commercial product emerges from that R&D. Notice I said on average. It could take five years, it could take three years, it could take 15. Some R&D might not pay off, but on average, how long does it take? Once you give me the answer to that question, then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. What were your R&D expenses each year for that amortizable life going back in time? The third step is purely mechanical. Here's what you need to do. Once you give me the amortizable life, I've got to write off the R&D over that period. So if you tell me, for instance, that your R&D has a five-year life, I'm going to write off one-fifth each year. I'm going to keep track of two numbers. I'm going to tr keep track of how much you're writing off this year. That's the amortization this year and how much is still left over. Sounds abstract, right? So let's take an example. This is the German technology company, SAP. I'm going to try to capitalize r and I'm going to assume it has a five-year life. Now, five years is not an unreasonably long period, but 10 years is what I use for pharmaceutical companies. I might use three for some technology companies, but here I've used five. I've collected the R&D expenses each year for the last five. I'm writing off one-fifth each year, so the R&D expense from five years ago, the last one-fifth is written off, and I'm keeping track of how much is left over. The R&D from five years ago, there's nothing left over. I've written it all off. Four years ago, I write off one-fifth, I have one-fifth left over. Three years ago, I write off one-fifth, there's two-fifths left over. So if you look at the last two columns on this page, the last column actually gives you the amortization from this year. It's the amount of R&D from prior years that I'm writing off this year. The second to last column, if you sum it up, gives me the value of the R&D that I've invested in, or for lack of a better term, the capital I've invested in R&D. You might say again, why, would, why do we go through these steps? Again, there are consequences, and here are the consequences. When I do this for SAP, let me trace through the effects. My operating income now is going to be different. Why? Because I'm going to add back the R&D expense, which was, which was expense before, because it's now a capital expense, and I'm going to subtract out the depreciation on the R&D. In the case of SAP, that increases my operating income. That doesn't always have to be the case. My cost of capital doesn't change, but including that unamortized portion of R&D in my capital changes my return on capital. Again, the net effect can be positive, negative, or neutral. As an example of a positive effect, take a look at this table. This is a valuation I did of Amgen. In my initial, the first column, you see my valuation of Amgen, trusting the accountants, treating R&D as an operating expense, and computing everything based on that premise. I get a value of about $43. In the second column, you see my valuation of, Am of Amgen with R&D capitalized. Different return on capital, different growth rates. The net effect is an increase in value per share of almost $31. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, that's Amgen. If you tried this for Merck, you might get a very different answer. Your value might actually decrease. 
What we're doing when we capitalize R&D is we hold it up to the same standards we do any other investment. There's nothing inherently good or bad about investing in R&D. If you're a commercial enterprise, the benefits of R&D ultimately have to show up in your earnings, and I'm holding these companies up to that standard. So that's getting the earnings right. But once you get the earnings right, here's the second step, is you need to compute the taxes that you would pay on that operating income, right? Well, that should be pretty simple if you have a tax rate. And there are two choices you have here. One is your effective tax rate, which for lack of a better term is like an average tax rate you pay across all of your income. The other is the marginal tax rate. That is the tax rate on your last dollar of income. As an example, in 2013, the marginal tax rate for U.S. corporations was roughly 40% for their U.S. income. The average effective tax rate was closer to 28 or 29%. Most companies have effective tax rates lower than the marginal tax rate. So big question when you compute your after-tax operating income is which tax rate to use. If you go to the marginal tax rate right off the, th the top, you're going to lower your cash flows. But I think you might be too conservative because you're essentially assuming that all of your income starting tomorrow will get taxed at that marginal tax rate. If you stay with the effective tax rate in perpetuity, you might be in trouble for a different reason. You might not be paying enough in taxes because those deferred taxes, the taxes that you're holding back on, eventually have to get paid. So here's one way I split the difference. I start with the effective tax rates. So in years one, two, and three, if I want to use 28%, I feel okay using 28%. But as I move out towards year five, year six, year eight, I will start moving the tax rate towards my marginal tax rate. Maybe I'm being too conservative, but I'd rather be too conservative on this issue than not conservative enough. Third step in the process is I need to subtract out reinvestment. Again, the accounting words that get, go into the reinvestment can be misleading. Capital expenditures minus depreciation is net capex, change in working capital. Looks at the investment in short-term assets. The accounting definitions are a little crimped, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to expand the definition of CapEx to include not just R&D, we just talked about how that was capital expenditure, but also acquisitions. Companies like Cisco that grow consistently through acquisitions, I have to count the cost of those acquisitions as part of my net CapEx. If I want to count the good stuff from, that comes from acquisitions, I have to count the bad stuff as well. When it comes to working capital, the accounting definition of working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. I'm going to modify the definition a little bit. I'm going to use non-debt current liabilities because short-term debt to me is part of debt in my cost of capital. And I'm not going to include cash in my current assets. Why? Because cash is not a wasting asset as far as I'm concerned. It's not a wasting asset because most cash is invested at a fair market rate commercial paper, T-bills, you might earn a low rate of return, but you're earning a fair rate of return. In other words, if you or I invest in something liquid and riskless, we'd earn roughly the same rate of return. So slight modifications, but they can make a big difference in your final numbers. Last step in the process, if you have to do free cash flow equity, you have to net out the cash flows from debt and to debt. Cash flows to debt will be interest and principal payments. Cash flows from debt will be new debt that you take on. So free cash flow equity is my generic measure of potential dividends. It starts with net income, so interest expenses are taken out. You still subtract out net capex and change in working capital. The reinvestment you subtract out to get to cash flow to the firm. But you now also subtract out the net cash flow from new debt issues netted out against debt repayments. That'll be your cash flow equity. So in summary, cash flows matter. Pay some attention to the details. There are lots of potholes in the computation of cash flows, and it's good to be able to know how to avoid them.